glory to Jesus Christ. So we're reading the Gospel of John, and I'm you the version I'm using here is the New American. That's the one we have in our parish, uh, the Saint Joseph, medium size, and this is a Catholic book publishing, New Jersey. As I said, why you know New Jersey's a fairly big place. Why didn't they say, you know, Englewood? New Jersey or whatever it was, they had it. And, and that was from, this is uh, 1986, from 1986. And we're on page, page uh, 153 in the back, 153, for uh, John 5, verse 31, witness to Jesus. So let's pray our prayer for uh, in reading Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Blessed Lord, who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may wisely hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 5, verse 31. If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony cannot be verified. Note I'm from Boston, my own behalf. Cannot be verified. But there is another who testifies on my behalf. And I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries to John and he testified to the truth. I do not accept testimony from a human being. But I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you were content to rejoice in his light. But I have testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. Moreover, the Father who sent me has testified on my behalf, but you have never heard his voice nor seen his form. And you do not have his word remaining in you because you do not believe in the one whom he had sent. You search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life through them. Even they testify on my behalf. But you do not want to come to me to have life. So we'll stop there for now. And uh, that's... So this testimony was always important in, in law courts and things like that. The, the Romans, and it was until actually fairly recently, even in the West, torture was often accepted to uh, produce a confession or a, a testimony because people would say anything. If you're tortured, I'd just say that. But at slaves especially, they acted as if, oh, well, if a slave isn't tortured, he won't tell the truth. Or something. So it was their... Law systems. I'm talking about the Greco-Roman. Uh, was seemed often uh, twisted to us, and then of course there was the the Jewish law system, the Torah, the uh, and and the the commentaries on the Torah and the applications of the first five books of the Bible that, that have so the uh, what is usually called the law in the Bible. Saint Paul talks about it. Uh, in that, that, but Jesus is saying, you think you can find your salvation in that? No, you're going to find your salvation in me. So, and, and this is, uh, again, who is salvation but God? So again, Jesus doesn't come out and say, okay, I'm God. Then they say, okay, get the rocks. He would have, they would have been, he would have been out of the picture long before the Sermon on the Mount because that would have considered blasphemy. And so they do say, like we did say that, that they, uh, because he had made himself equal to God. But he didn't make himself, he was equal to God, because he was God, God, it, it, not in his humanity, in his divinity. He's equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's one in being with them. But in his humanity, he's one with us. A man like us in all things but sin. But of course, now he has the risen, the, the resurrected humanity that we are aspiring to, that we will have through him, he promised that we would have. I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever has faith in me, even if he dies, shall live. And whoever lives in his faith in me will never die. So uh, so the footnotes here, 
about this, t- talking about verse 31. Uh, another testi- one testifying is likely the father who in four different ways gives testimony to Jesus. So it, it doesn't say what those four ways are, but uh, you can get, he, that does say, it does say that later. Uh, so we get that. So uh, they have that. And then he talks about John here. Uh, see Psalm 132, 17. I will place a lamp for my anointed, David, and possibly, and possibly the description of Elijah in Sirach 48, 1 but only for a while, indicating the temporary and subordinate nature of John's mission. So John is the, he's the prodromos, that's the forerunner. And a forerunner was someone who literally ran in front of the king, usually a good distance or some important person. So going to some village and he'd come by. So he didn't always run, sometimes he was on a horse or whatever like that. But uh, he'd say, you know, the great and mighty so-and-so is coming. So the people all could come out and wave palms or whatever and, uh, and salute him, stuff like that, and as he passed through. Or, uh, to, quote, unquote, entertain him if he came through. He, this guy who had all this, this stuff, the, you, all, the poor people had to, had to entertain him with their, their means. So anyway, so uh, John the Baptist is that for Christ, but it, the, the forerunner is just saying who's coming ahead. So he does that. So John says that. And he says, you know, uh, I'm not worthy to untie his, his sandal, which was the, uh, the lowest of the slaves would do that if they did that. So there's a, so a painting from uh, Pompeii that has a slave doing it. And the, the slave is made really small and he's t- uh, taking the shoe sandals off. And they were paying no attention to him. They were doing that. So... Uh, so he says about the testimony there. So let's see what uh, Fre- uh, Father Francis Martin and William M. Wright the Fourth was he on Toby Gillis? I don't know. No, he wasn't. Um, Francis Martin uh, is that. So this is a uh, from the Gospel of John a Baker. It's in the Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. And it's uh, published by Baker Academic, a division of Baker Publishing Group, Grand Rapids, Michigan. This was published in 2015 by Francis Martin and William M. Wright. So it must be Wright, because he's in that. So, uh, and this is page, page 107. And he has that. So he says... Thus far, Jesus has been refuting the charges of Sabbath violation and blasphemy on the basis of his identity as the obedient son who only does what he receives from the father. We just had that in the earlier part of of, uh, this chapter. In doing so, Jesus has explained that the healing of the paralytic is a sign revealing him to be the son who has uniquely divine power to do the father's work. So, with, with this uniquely divine power where he forgives sins and all this other stuff. That's, that is divine power. It, it's the power only God has. He's, he has the authority of God because he's God. The only person who has the authority of God is God. Now, God can give out aspects of authority. You know, in the church and all this, in the family, you know, the parents and stuff like that. But only God is the total authority. So and uh, so Jesus continues his defense by calling witnesses who identify, who testify to his identity. John the Baptist, number one, is the first one he brings up, because John the Baptist pointed to him and he told his followers to follow Jesus. His own works, his miracles, because uh, they're not demonic miracles, although they try to blame, say it, you know, say that's. It's demonic, but uh, it's not, it's, it's doing good. The Father, which is the ultimate witness, and the scriptures. Uh, so they testify to him, but of course it has to be the scriptures rightly read, because otherwise you won't see him in it. So 
So Jesus' identity as the son is the basis on which he's been refuting the charges brought against him, which would be basically blasphemy, <laughs> and breaking the law, you know, healing on the Sabbath. And uh, he, he seems to go out of his way to, to heal people on the Sabbath. So uh, for the sake, but of course, if it's a healing, then it's God doing it. So it's God working on the Sabbath. And of course, God has to, quote unquote, work all the time or we wouldn't be around. If God, you know, who's the ground of all being, whatever, we would just all uh, evaporate into nothingness if he, if he wants. So uh, for the sake of argument, he grants the Jewish legal principle that forbids self-testimony. So in a juridical proceeding. If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony cannot be verified. So he says that. Accordingly, yeah, they have this, noted by Ray Brown in the Gospel according to John, the invalidity of self-testimony in a legal proceeding is attested in the Mishnah Ketubot, it's uh, two nine. You, of course, you were about to say that, weren't you? It was the first one. Uh, none may be believed when he testifies of himself. None may testify of himself in the Mishnah. And so they go there too. And it says all quotations from the Mishnah are from Herbert Danby, nineteen thirty three. <coughs> the uh, he translated that. Um, Oops, I guess. Accordingly, Jesus begins to call witnesses to testify on his behalf. He mentions another who testifies, and this is, this is God the Father, the ultimate witness behind the others whom Jesus will call. So, uh, God the Father has to be the ultimate witness, along with the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, and the Son for that. But of course, this is the Son acting here, so the Father and the Holy Spirit have to witness to him. The first witness we call to the stand is John the Baptist, to whom the same Jewish authorities Jesus now debates had sent emissaries before. You remember they went and they said, you know, why? What are you? Why are you baptizing? What, what authority are you doing all this? Other stuff? Are you the Christ? No, are you are you the uh, the Messiah? Are, are you just the Christ? Are are you the Elijah? Which Jesus does says yes, he is Elijah, but he says no. At that point, he didn't recognize that himself. Are you the, the prophet, which would also be the, uh, could be tied in with the Messiah. Some would see that as a different person, the ultimate prophet. But of course, the real ultimate prophet would be God incarnate. The ultimate messenger has to be the one who's the ultimate message. So, so, and then, so then, uh, so John the Baptist testified to the truth, meaning Jesus says he is. Because what, what does Jesus say of himself? I am, again, I am, that would evoke God. I am who I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Alithea, hey Alithea, I'm the truth. Now, a prophet or someone could say, I know the truth. Or, 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 or I know the way to the truth. Uh, and I know how to live. I can teach you uh, the life. But to say I'm the way, the truth, and the life is to say I'm God. And even stronger would be I am the resurrection and the life. But only God can say that. So uh, in a lot of his I am, I am the bread of life. Only God can say that. And then when he says uh, I'm, before Abraham was I am, that they, they're going to stone him then. And then he slips away, probably pulls his his uh, prayer shawl over his head or something that slips into the crowd. And because at one time, but he so alienates, the, he so enrages the people in Nazareth by t t uh, saying, God, there were plenty of people who needed things in the times of the prophets, but uh, he cites the, the widow of Zarephath, who was a Gentile, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, the general, the Syrian general, uh, healed by Eli Elisha, and that, and so, um, and so they're going to throw him off the cliff. 
in, in Nazareth, but he slips away. It doesn't tell how he slipped away, but uh, he did. He, and he, did, it's a, he doesn't use Nazareth as, as a place. We don't even really hear him go into Nazareth much. Because mm -hmm. the place is more his uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Bethesda, stuff like that. Those are not Bethesda. What's the name of the place? Uh, um, Capernaum. Bethsaida. Bethsaida. But yeah. on the Sea of Galilee there. But... Um, those were his, his uh, the places that he came, not out of Nazareth. And people, uh, uh, Nazareth was a, a nowhere. What good can come from Nazareth? So, I had a friend who used to say, what good can come from Somerville to me? That's where I come from. But, so anyway, so, but I came from Somerville, I'm pretty good. So, uh, so that, uh, he declared that he was preparing the Lord's coming and bore witness that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And we saw that in, cha in verse chapter one, the Lamb of God, the, the Passover sacrifice, the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice, the blood, the, the salvific blood that was over the, the doorpost. This, that was a foreshadowing of, of God coming into this, taking on our human nature and then going through everything we go through and dying in our human nature as, as, as the all-sufficient sacrifice. An analogy, of course, to the, the sacrificial system that they had, that the, the Jewish people had, that they borrowed from their pagan neighbors for the most part. But the meaning would be transformed. They weren't feeding the gods or anything like that. Their meanings were changed. So, so he's the Lamb of God and he's testified as the Son of God, 134. Uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 34. Anointed with the Holy Spirit, Christed, Hamashiach. So that would be too. That, uh, <coughs> so the kings were anointed, oil would be put on their head. Samuel does that to Saul and David. <coughs> and, uh, excuse me, I'm going to yawn. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay. Um, he anointed the whole, with the Holy Spirit. So in, 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 in this, in, 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 in the synagogue, in time he reads, he says, this is now fulfilled in your hearing about himself. Again, they said to him. Uh, they thought they knew him and all this stuff, so. Um, but he said, the, John the Baptist wasn't the light. Jesus is the light. But he came to testify to the light, to point out where the light is. So, uh, you know, it's, well, it's, the, it's like, where's your cell phone if you've turned off? And John the Baptist says, I know where it is. Stuff like that. So, uh, since the Baptist was not the light, but came to testify to the light, that's verse 8 in chapter 1. Jesus says that he was a burning and shining lamp. That's, uh, but he's not the, flat, the light, he's the lamp of the light. So, uh, and that was important for these people to have, if you, ha you wanted to conserve your olive oil. So, uh, you would uh, make sure the, your, your, your inside was white, the, uh, not your inside of you, inside of the house. And then you, you, the lamp would be put in a place that it could shine, it shot the much light. And if you wanted to do things, usually you did it outside in the daytime, rather than consume your oil, unless you were really rich. So there was consume your, uh, uh, conspicuous consumption sometimes. It, they'd have, they, really rich people would have, a, a, it was almost like a bowl that would have little, uh, they, and they, uh, they'd have little lamps, little uh, wicks and all the bowl around that would, uh, so that would light up. Why these places didn't all burn down, I don't know. But anyway, even that I was thinking, you know, most of human history, there's a book I have, which also I haven't read yet, uh, called uh, uh, When the Only Light Was Fire. So, you know, it was excluding the sun, etc. So, um, about from the, it was, uh, it's a history of, of, uh, of civilization until the 19th century. 
in the West, I think. I said, they said I haven't read it. I like the title. Someone gave it to me. So a burning and shining light. But that's what we're called to be, too. So we're not the fire. We're not the light. We're the, the witnesses to the light. And we're the lamp holding the light. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world, which, of course, is God. It's, that makes sense. But then he says, you are the light of the world. But it, we're uh, lights dependent on the other light, on the fire from the, the other light, to get into that. So... Uh, <clears throat> So, which is, so, while Jesus does not need or accept testimony for a human being, well, that is, that's what the uh, these authorities want, he cites the Baptist as a witness for their sake, so that you may be saved, which is not, they said, we, you know, we're, people come to us about salvation, but not, you know, how dare you say stuff like that. And the other, uh, in the movie, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, about St. Francis, mm-hmm. So he in, in the it's fictionalized, but he's in in, uh, in front of Pope uh, Pope, Pope Innocent or whoever it was Innocent III. third, and uh, he starts uh, <laughs> quoting from the Sermon on the Mount, and one of these cardinals are there and they're you know lounging around like this, and he said, "How dare he preach the gospel to us?" <laughs> so, uh, but that is often what is really needed. The uh, people who are supposed to be proclaiming the gospel often need to have the gospel given to them. We all need that uh, refurbishment, that renewal. So uh, Jesus does not need the, the Baptist's testimony to give him legitimacy, but he cites it as a help for others to believe in him. So uh, that so during the short time that the Baptist conducted his ministry, the authorities sought him out. But not, you know, to, you know, to interrogate him. You were content to rejoice in his light, so that that gives a positive spin on it, which I don't think they really seem to be taking it, that positive thing. Because what does he call them? He calls them, you know, vipers, brood of vipers. All this is not exactly diplomatic language. But, but they did not accept the Baptist witness about Jesus in Ezekiel. The Lord himself described this phenomenon, telling the prophet, for them, you are only a singer of love songs with a pleasant voice and a clever touch. They listen to your words, but they do not obey them. Ezekiel thirty-three, thirty-two. The Baptist may have been a fascinating person with interesting things to say, but the authorities were not really affected by his testimony. So it often like that, like... Uh, um, uh, Harriet Antipas liked to listen to John the Baptist in the prison, who was probably railing against him, but it was uh, probably like, you know, like people like to say, well, I like to go to horror movies. Some people would say it's like that, yeah. So uh, I said, not the modern ones. Eh, they're gross. The old ones, especially the ones that you'd laugh at, the, the B movies from the 1950s. You know, I was a, a teenaged uh, werewolf or something uh, uh-huh. or uh, from P- Planet X. Something like that, but uh, he liked to listen to him. The Baptist, meaning John the Baptist, of course, may have had a fascinating person with interesting things to say, but the authorities were not really affected by his testimony. Again, so it's, it's you, it means it's your life being transformed, and they say, well, I don't really want my life transformed. I want to take over. I want to, I want to be the center of my universe. And preferably the center of everybody else's universe. But that's not the way to happiness. The second witness is the work that the Father gave him. And this testimony is greater than John's. This is on page 108. As Lucien Serfaux puts it, the miracles of the Son, his works, are in reality the work of the Father, his essential activity of creating and giving life. Because uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always act together, one, one action. They, they're not in competition or something like that. You know, they, got, they don't have the chart up there and say, oh, well, yeah, the Father's ahead by five points, so we'll see. Uh, no. 
his essential activity of creating giving life. As we look upon these, we see in one and the same regard the Son and the Father whom he makes known. So the Father makes known the Son, but the Son points to the Father. And the Holy Spirit is self-effacing. The Holy Spirit is the one who points them both out. And that's from Lucien Serfo, Les Miracles, Signes Messianiques de Jésus est ouvert de Dieu, selon l'Évangile de Saint Jean. <coughs> well, pardon my French, literally. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so what does he do? The Father has sent him. So, Jesus' signs bear witness that the Father has sent him. The healing of the paralytic on the Sabbath reveals that Jesus is the Son who possesses in himself divine power and obediently does the Father's work. So even though the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are totally equal, totally co-eternal, etc., etc., the Father is the, the head of the household of the Trinity. He's the, the monarch of the, that. But of course, he's a, but in, to use the Latin phrase, a primus inter pares, a first among equals. But there's the, the, the deference in that. But they're, they're, as persons, they're equal. Because the Father is the one who's first revealed. It comes out. Third, Jesus appeals to the direct testimony of the Father, whose word Jesus speaks and whose works he performs. The qualifying statement, but you have never heard his voice or seen his form. Of course, they wouldn't see his form because he doesn't have a form. But Jesus knows his form because he's one in being with him. So, and again, you can just see them, the more Jesus says, you can see the more, you know, like the angrier they get and the more put up are they by this. This probably alludes to the traditional description of God's appearance on Mount Sinai. Moses tells the Israelites, the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Deuteronomy 4.12. If Deuteronomy says that the Israelites heard the voice, the Lord's voice at Sinai, and Jesus specifies that they have never heard the Father's voice, then whose voice did the Israelites hear speaking at Sinai? The implication seems to be that the Sinai theophany, theophany is the manifestation of God was a manifestation of the divine word, God the Son. So if uh, God shows himself in human form in the Old Testament, it's the resurrected Christ who has the human form and all this stuff. So that's one view of that, rather than say it's, it's a, you know, an abstract vision that the person had. Uh, but a, a concrete meeting with God uh, in who, who, who took on himself the fullness of our humanity and is risen from the dead. And because he's risen from the dead, he can be, time and space are not a barrier. So. The implication seems to be that the Sinai Theophany was a manifestation of the divine word, God the Son. The prologue, that's the first part of the, the first chapter of John. No one has ever seen God. The only Son, God, so he's being called their God, but some of them try to say, oh no, that's, uh, it, no. The only Son, God, who is at the Father's side has revealed him. Chapter 1, verse 18. Similarly, Jesus later says, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who's from God, that is the Son. That's chapter 6, verse 26. Only the divine word, the Son existing from all time, has seen that. So, so we have his word. Where was I lost? My place. Um, only the divine word, the Son existing from the Father from all eternity can reveal the Father. Because the, the only uh, the only ones who share this, the divine essence are the persons of the Trinity. We don't. We can be given gifted a, a participation in the divine nature. We can be given the energies of God, the grace of God, gifted to us, uh, and we can receive that because we're the image of God, not in our bodies. 
but in our souls. So, uh, so we can uh, plug that in. Only the divine word, the Son existing from the, with the Father from all eternity can reveal the Father, because he's God. Similarly, other New Testament passages speak of the Son as the Father's expression, the express image. So to be the express image, this, uh, there were these people I knew and all their children, they, they sort of looked like each other. Anyway, they were, they were you know, red hair, and they weren't related, but they, you know, looked like each other. All their kids looked the same. There was just different, the different sexes, different ages, different sizes. They all basically all looked, looked the same. So, well, I, that was when they were children. I have no idea once they, you know, became adults, what they looked like. But, um, so that the express image, so to have, be the express image is to be God. The image should be the express image of God, not a relative image of God like we are, but to be the express image of God is to be God. The Colossians 1.15. Although the Father bears witness, Jesus says that his opponents do not have the word remaining with them. This is so, Jesus says, because you do not believe in the one he, whom he has sent. So he said, if you were really... Uh, in tuned to this, you would recognize me. You would accept that. So Jesus is the Father's word, that image, the logos, from the, the, the uh, analogy. So we have the analogy of the relation of the first and second person of the Trinity, Father and Son, an analogy to the human. But also we have speaker and word, another analogy to the human. So... Uh, Jesus' opponents do not have the Father's word dwelling within them because they do not receive Jesus, whom the Father sent to reveal the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. At this point, Jesus shifts from being the accused to being the accuser. So is it now, it's, uh, now, he, now he becomes the, uh, the prosecuting attorney at this. From refuting his opponent's charges, he goes on the offensive to countercharge which uh, his opponents, ironically, while the authorities have never seen the Father's form nor heard his voice, he is right there in their midst. They do not recognize this because they do not believe in Jesus. The, uh, chapter 5, verse 37. The last witness Jesus calls <coughs> to the witness stand is the scriptures. Because the scriptures are the Old Testament. And there's diversity on what the canon of the what books were in the Old Testament. Remember, these are scrolls. It's not, you know, like one book. Here it is. And there were different groups. We talked about this before that had said what different books were in the Bible, like the Sadducees, only the first five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the written Torah. And the, the, the Pharisees had more. They had, uh, you know, many, most of the, most of the prophets and uh, the writings the, uh, the wisdom literature, but they didn't have it all. And then the, the Alexandrian canon had more like we have, and then there were, there were variants of the other. Then there was the Essenes. They had their own thing, it seems, because it wasn't, again, in a book. So when they discovered those in jars, there were these different scrolls. So, you know, were, were these things that were written in biblices, you know, they were written like books of the Bible. Did they consider them to be books of the Bible? At that time, the Essene people, the, uh, Co the Qumran Dead Sea people. So, so he calls the scriptures. His opponents search and study scripture as the source and path to eternal life. But they have objected to Jesus' words and deeds on the basis of their interpretation of scripture. So people say, oh, I go by the Bible, only by the Bible. But the reality is you go by your interpretation or, or the interpretation of somebody else that you take for this. And even if you say, well, I take this literally, but then if you just take that literally, why don't you take this other thing literally? Or why, you're going by a tradition that's, that's telling you how to interpret it. Or because or, or, or you may have a pastiche of traditions, like having chocolates 
or you'd say, well, I'll take one of these, and one of those, and one of those. <coughs> but in the end, you're the arbiter of it. So it's description, it's because we're all approaching the scriptures. But, and if it was, if it had what they call perspicuity, that it was so clear that it would come out, then uh, all people of goodwill, prayerful people of goodwill, would come out with the same, the same interpretation of them. But it's scripture in the tradition, the mosaic slash apostolic tradition, the mos- tradition before the Old Testament tradition, then the New Testament one, which is the one that illumines the whole thing, and the church. The church is the authoritative interpreter of that. So, of scripture. So, the... Uh, no, Jesus cites the scriptures as bearing witness on his behalf, not against him. The Old Testament bears witness to Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promise to, to save. But of course, his opponents don't see that. They say, that you're, here's another blasphemy of yours. And his witness comes to light only through faith, the fulfillment of God's promise to save, through faith in Jesus, so we're putting that into effect an interior action of the Holy Spirit in the believer. See chapter 12, verse 16, and chapter 14, 26. Jesus' opponents who do not believe in him, uh, and that's putting it mildly, prefer their own understanding of Scripture to the living, personal presence of that word, the, the eternal word, there with them. The Logos. By resisting him, they fail to have the Father's testimony impressed on their hearts. As 1 John 5, 9 through 10 states, Now the testimony of God is this, that he has testified on behalf of his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. And here believing doesn't just mean a head thing. It means you're investing yourself and you're having faith in him. Of course, it does include your intellect. But it's your will, too, and it's ultimately your whole self that you're investing. Jesus then links the inability of the accusers to receive his testimony with a willful decision on their part. But you do not want to come to me to have life. Jesus' opponents look upon the scripture as a means of, for receiving eternal life, but they refuse to approach the one to whom the Father gives eternal life. Doing that. So because they don't see him revealed in the scripture. And then this is the reflection and application on page 110. God speaks to people through his word and scripture. And to receive the word, certain dispositions are required on our part as readers. So let's say I can, if I can be cynical and I can read the scripture. I can get a, you know, a doctorate in, in scripture and you know, know the languages, and all the, but have no, no belief in it. And it's just, you know, there would be just a sociology of, of scripture, a, a history of scripture, I'm not of that. But I'm not meeting the living God in it. So then it's, uh, as someone once said about all of these, you know, these, uh, uh, what they call criticisms of scripture, it doesn't mean neg- a negative thing necessarily. So the uh, an- analysis of scripture, they said, with some people, this all, all method and no madness. You need the, you, know, you want to meet the living God in this. So, um, so, and to receive the word, certain dispositions are required on the part of the reader. First, faith is a matter of receiving God's action, which moves us to the reality revealed by its light. Also, we need to be humble and receptive to the Holy Spirit's action within us. So if I approach scripture in a haughty way, say, it's all about me, although I'm not going to admit that. It's all about me, and uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to resist the Holy Spirit. Now, I may even think that I, I can control the Holy Spirit, but that if, if you can control the Holy Spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit you're controlling. So, it's the other way around. You're not supposed to have the Holy Spirit on the leash. The Holy Spirit's supposed to have you on the leash. That's right. And then you won't go out the dog door. And go out the dog. Uh, so, when we read scripture, so we need to be humble and receptive to the Holy Spirit's action within us, and especially within the church, or within, within the scripture. We really believe that this is, is inspired word of God. And again, in this context, it's the right kind of context, 
of holy tradition and the church and in natural law too. Otherwise, we could, you can end up making a text say anything you really want to, want to, want it to. So, when we read scripture prayerfully, we should realize that we are reading God's word, addressing us powerfully in the present moment. So, and, and we use the different, we talked about the senses of scripture, not just the, the literal, which is the foundational one, but the, the different spiritual senses in this. So it's, 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 the, the Lord might speak to us in this, this scripture. Because if you, you get things, and they could, especially a lot of Old Testament things, things from the Torah, it could be not just, or historical things, not just alien, but horrifying. And, and, and like the opposite of, of what is good and true. And stuff. But if, if I read it that way, then I'm not reading it properly. Because as a Christian, we read it in Jesus, through Jesus. Uh, in the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit in the church. So, it dresses us powerfully in the present moment. So that's why often people have the Lexio Divina. They pray and they have a little bit. Uh, they ta- and they, they they have group Lexio Divina too. They're, you can do that. But uh, an approach to Scripture, a, a prayerful approach to meet Christ there. So as the letter of the Hebrews teaches, the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even between soul and spirit. So that, that's the tripartite view of the, not just body and soul, but body, soul, and spirit. So having that. So, and, and said, well, how can you get like in between soul and spirit? You know, so that, that's why he's talking, he said this, the word of God is so effective and so, such a, a, a perfect blade, like obsidian. Obsidian blades was what they used often, which uh, some surgeons use today, because they say they're better even than the, the, uh, the steel blades that they have for the precision of the cutting. The, um, The joints and marrow and able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. Let us approach the scripture as God's word to us in the present moment. But a spirit of faith, humility, and receptivity to the spirit working within us. Do you want to go on? We'll, uh, we won't. we'll do 41 next time. But we can look at... Uh, Father uh, Harrington's, what Father Harrington has to say. In this. this is from the Jerome Biblical, from, which is also from New Jersey, but they tell us where in New Jersey it's from. It's from, drum roll please, published by, thank you, Prentice Hall, Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, 1968. This is the old one, as you can tell. It's been through a lot. <coughs> then, um, oh, now I lost my page. Ah, here he is. No, it is not it. Oh. Okay. Where is it? Okay, here we are. Jesus' witness is the Father himself, the work that he performs, both his words of life and the deeds that he does, which are the Father's gift to him and through him to us, manifestly show that he has been sent by God. The works, however, remain only indirect testimony. The Father who sent me has given testimony on my behalf. Jesus refers to the interior testimony God gives to those who have true faith. So the, the, his opponents don't respond to that. So see Romans eight sixteen. So attend to his voice, the voice of God. In Jesus' words, the voice of God is discerned by those who are responsive to God's grace. So again, if I take this and then I, I, I use all the tools, but instead of putting it together, I take it apart. So that's 
uh, you know, that's not what it's for. It's there to, again, to meet, to meet God is the purpose. So uh, historical analysis of it is very interesting. It can be very, uh, it can be a tool, a useful tool, but it's not the end. The goal of the goal is to meet, meet God in scripture. So then, uh, so by contrast, those now listen to him by their disbelief are blind and have not seen what he is like. His enduring word you do not have in your hearts. Again, that's not the height of diplomacy. This repeats the idea of, of the preceding verse. However, John probably intends a subtler significance by his choice of words to reproduce our Lord's thought. The enduring word, logon, menenorta, menenorta, meneo is, is remember. So this is, this, it's keeping there, it's, 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 it's not uh, fading away. Uh, the enduring word of God, not possessed by the disbeliever, contrasts with the incarnate word who abides, menain, stays, which our word remain is the same Indo-European root for that. Uh, the word abides with his disciples. So he stays with us. Yes, Jesus has ascended into heaven, but he's here. He's here with us in a very special way, especially in the Eucharist. But he's here with us all the time. So we, if we're in, in grace... Where we're living shrines of the Holy Spirit, of the Father, uh, and of Jesus. We're living tabernacles, uh, bring that to be channels to other people, and to have that uh, more and more nourished, our temple more and more uh, illuminated by electric candles, but no, by, by God's grace in our lives. No. Yeah. You search the scriptures in which you think you have eternal life. The Old Testament scriptures, however, could only lead to Jesus, see Galatians 3.24, in whom alone life is to be found. And see Galatians 3.21. They also give witness on my behalf that is the scriptures. Rightly used, the scriptures would not stand in the way, but would rather lead the believer from themselves to Christ. The point is made at the onset that this incredulity they, that they refuse to accept him as there is, was willful. He said that, you know, you see, there are these miracles. You see, rather than say, well, let's examine these to see, you know, what's God saying to us? They, they find Christ a threat. And so, you know, it's by Beelzebul uh, that this happens. And so, well, we'll stop there. There. And let's pray the Our Father, Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And who's watching? Greg Corrieri. Let's wave. I should put... Uh, there you go. Oh, no. Yeah. Wave. Wave now. And uh, Kim Smith. Ta-da. Wave. Okay. Let me not erase this. So I push finish. Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Okay.